Hello. My name is Mitch. I'm here to tell you guys about my experience that I had. I don't know if it was paranormal or whatever stupid words people use to describe superhuman phenomena these days, but after the thing visited me, I believe in that paranormal trash now. A week after I moved in with my brother Edwin, after my house was foreclosed, I finished packing. Edwin liked the idea of me moving in since we had not seen each other for 10 years, so I was excited too. I soon fell asleep after I moved in. After that first week, I heard rustling noises coming from outside about 1 in the morning. I thought it was a raccoon, so I ignored it and tried to fall asleep. The next morning, I told Edwin about it and he agreed. The next night, however, I thought I heard my window opening and a loud thud, as if something entered my room. I darted up and looked around my room, but I saw nothing. The next morning, Edwin dropped his coffee cup when he saw me. He held up a nearby mirror and I saw myself. I had a large gash in my left cheek. After I was rushed to the hospital, my doctor told me that I must have been sleepwalking. But then he showed me something that made my blood turn cold. He lifted up my shirt to reveal a sewn up incision where my kidneys were. I stared into his eyes, the mind widening. You somehow lost your left kidney last night? My doctor told me. We don't know how though. Sorry Mitch. The next night was my breaking point. Around midnight, I woke up to see a truly horrifying sight. I was staring face to face with a creature with a black hoodie and dark blue mask with no nose or mouth staring down at me. The last thing that scared me the most was that it had no eyes, just empty, black sockets. The creature also had some black substance dripping from its sockets. I grabbed a camera from the nearby mantle and took a picture. Immediately after taking a shot, the creature lunged at me and tried to claw open my chest to get to my lungs. I stopped it by kicking it in the face. As I ran out of my room, I grabbed my wallet. I would need the money. I ran out of my brother's house into the night. I eventually ended up in the woods near Edwin's house and tripped on a rock. I fell unconscious and woke up in the hospital. My doctor, the same one who treated me before, entered the room. I have good news and bad news, Mitch, my doctor started. The good news is that you've had minor injuries and your parents are going to pick you up. I sighed with relief. The bad news is that your brother has been killed by some thing. I'm sorry. My parents took me back to Edwin's house to collect my remaining belongings, which I did. Upon entering my room, I was scared, but remained calm. I grabbed my camera and then stopped dead in my tracks. In the hallway leading to my room, I saw Edwin's body and something small lying next to it. I retrieved it up and entered my parents' car. Not mentioning Edwin's corpse. I looked at the thing that I had picked up and nearly vomited. I was holding my stolen half-eaten kidney with some black substance on it. It was a nice summer. My five-year-old son James was playing outside in the backyard of our suburban home. James has always been a quiet boy. He plays by himself mostly. He never had many friends, but he had always had a wild imagination. I was in the kitchen feeding our dog Fido when I heard what sounded like James talking to someone in the backyard. I'm not sure who he was talking to or who he could have been talking to. Could he have finally made a friend? Being a single mom, it's hard for me to always keep an eye on my son. So I decided to go outside and check on him. 
When I went into the backyard, I was a bit confused, because James was the only person back there. Was he talking to himself? I could have sworn I heard another voice. James, it's time to come inside. I called out to him. He came inside and sat down on the kitchen table. It was about lunchtime, so I decided to make him a turkey sandwich. James, who are you talking to out there? I asked. And James looked up for a moment. Oh, I was playing with my new friend, he said smiling. I poured him some milk and continued to pry, as any good mother would. Does your friend have a name? Why didn't you ask him to have lunch with us? I asked. James stared at me for a moment before replying. His name is Laughing Jack. And I was a bit taken aback by this, and so I just said, Oh, that's a strange name. What does your friend look like? I asked a bit confused. He's a clown. He has long hair and a big swirly cone nose. He's got long arms and baggy pants with stripy socks, and he's always smiling. I realized my son was talking about an imaginary friend. I thought it was, it was normal for kids his age to have imaginary friends, especially when he has no real kids to play with. It's probably just a phase. The rest of the day went by as usual, and it was just starting to get late, so I put James to bed. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and made sure to turn on his nightlight before I closed the door. I was pretty tired myself, so I decided to go to bed not long after. But I had an awful nightmare. It was dark, and I was in some kind of run-down amusement park. I was scared, running through an endless field of empty tents, broken down rides, and abandoned game huts. The whole place had a horrible look to it. Everything was black and white, and the prized stuffed animals all hung from nooses in the game huts, all with sick grins stitched on their faces. It felt like the whole park was looking at me, even though there wasn't another living thing in sight. Then suddenly, I began to hear music play. The sounds of Pop Goes the Weasel being played on a squeeze box echoed throughout the park. It was hypnotizing. I followed its tune to the circus tents almost in a trance, unable to stop my legs from moving forward. It was pitch black, and the only light came from a single spotlight shining on the center of the big top. As I walked towards the light, the music slowed down, and I found myself singing along, unable to stop. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel, the monkey threw, twas all in fun. The music stopped right before its climax, and suddenly the lights shot on. The intensity of the lights was practically blinding. All I could see was a small dark silhouette shuffling towards me. Then another one appeared, and another, and another. There were dozens of them all coming towards me. I couldn't move and my legs were frozen. All I could do was watch all the haunting figures draw near. As I got closer I could see they were children. As I looked at each one I noticed that they were all horribly disfigured and mutilated. Some had cuts all over their bodies and others were severely burnt and others were missing limbs and even their eyes. The children enveloped me, clawing at my flesh and dragging me to the ground, and tearing him inside me. As the children tore me apart and I faded away, all I could hear was laughter. Horrible, awful, evil laughter. I awoke the next morning in a cold sweat. After taking a few deep breaths, I looked over and saw that a few of James's action figures were positioned facing me on top of my nightstand. I sighed. James had probably woken up early and put these here. I gathered up the toys and made my way to James's room. However, when I opened the door, James was sound asleep. I just shrugged and placed the toys back into his toy box and headed out of the living room. 
A little while later, James woke up and I made his breakfast. He was quiet and seemed a bit groggy. Perhaps he didn't sleep well either. I decided to ask him about the toys. James, honey, did you put the toys in mommy's room this morning? His eyes shot up at me for a moment and then quickly glanced back down at his cereal. Laughing Jack did it. I rolled my eyes and responded. Well, you tell Laughing Jack to keep the toys in your room. James nodded and finished up his breakfast, then decided to go play out in the backyard. I went to relax in the living room and I must have dozed off because I woke up a couple of hours later. Shit! I need to check on James. I was a bit worried as it had been over two hours and I hadn't checked on him. I went and stepped out into the backyard, but James wasn't there. I was getting nervous, so I called out to him. James? James, where are you? Just then, I heard a giggle from the front yard. I rushed to the gate around the front of the house. James was sitting on the sidewalk. I breathed a sigh of relief and walked over to him. James, how many times have I told you to stay in the backyard? James? What are you eating? James looked up at me and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of hard candies in all colors. And this made me very nervous. James, who gave you that candy? And James just stared at me and not speaking. James, please tell mommy where you got that candy. James hung his head down low and said, Laughing Jack gave it to me. My heart sank, and I kneeled down and looked at him in the eye. James, I've had enough of this damn Laughing Jack thing. He is not real. Now, this is a very serious situation, and I need to know who gave you the candy. I could see my son's eyes tear up. But Mama, Laughing Jack did give me the candy. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. James has never lied to me, but what he's telling me is impossible. I made him spit out the candy and throw the rest away. James appeared to be fine. Maybe I'm just overreacting after all. He could have just gotten it from Tom and Linda from next door, or maybe Mr. Walker down the street. Either way, I'm going to have to keep a closer eye on James. That night, I put James to bed as usual and decided to go to bed early myself. Suddenly, I was woken up by a loud banging from the kitchen. I sprung out of bed and hurried down the stairs. When I got to the kitchen, I was horrified. Everything on the counters had been thrown to the floor, and our dog Fido hung dead from the light fixture. His stomach was cut open and stuffed with candy and the same type that James was eating earlier that day. My shock was quickly broken by a sharp scream from James's room followed by loud crashes. I quickly grabbed a knife from the drawer and moved up the stairs with the speed that only a mother whose child was in danger could have. I burst through the door and flicked on the lights. Everything in the room was knocked over and tossed on the floor. My poor son in his bed crying and shaking with fear. A pool of urine stained the sheets. I scooped up my child and ran out the house and went next door to Tom and Linda's house. Luckily, they were still awake. They let me use their phone and I called the police. It didn't take them long to arrive and I explained what had happened. They looked at me as if I were crazy. They searched the house, but all they found was a dead dog in two trash rooms. The officer told me that someone had probably gotten into the house and done this right before making a quick escape when they heard me coming up the stairs. I knew it wasn't true. All the doors were locked and none of the windows were open. Whatever was in my house didn't come from the outside. The next day, James stayed inside. I didn't want him to leave my sight. I went into the garage and found his old baby monitor and set it up in his room if anything comes into the night. I was going to be able to hear it. I went to the kitchen and grabbed the largest knife from the drawer and put it in my nightstand. Imaginary friend or not, 
I'm not letting anything hurt my little boy. Soon enough, night came. I put James to bed and he was afraid, but I promised him that I wasn't going to let anything happen to him. I tucked him in and gave him a kiss and turned on the nightlight. Before closing the door, I whispered to him, Good night, James. I love you. I tried to stay up as long as I could, but after a few hours, I felt myself drifting off. My baby would be safe for the night, and I needed to sleep. Just as I lay my head on the pillow, I heard a soft noise come from the baby monitor that I had put on the nightstand. At first, it sounded like interference, like the kind of radio would make. Then it turned into a soft moan, which changed to sleep. And then I heard it. The laugh from my nightmare. That horrible laugh. I sprang up from bed and grabbed the knife from under my pillow. I rushed over to James's room and creaked open the door. I tried the light switch, but it wouldn't come on. I took a step in and I could feel the warm, thick liquid on my feet. Suddenly, James's night light came on and I could see the absolute horror laid out in front of me. James's body was nailed up on the wall. The nails pierced through his hands and feet. His chest was cut wide open and his organs hung down onto the floor. His eyes and tongue had been removed along with most of his teeth. I was disgusted. I could hardly believe that that was my baby boy. Then I heard it again. A soft, desperate moan. James was still alive. My baby, my poor baby. He is in so much pain and barely clinging to life. I ran across the room and vomited on the floor, but my sickness was interrupted by a horrible cackle coming from behind me. I sweat around while still wiping bile from my mouth. Then out of the shadows emerged the fiend responsible for all this horror. Laughing Jack. His ghost white skin and matted black hair hung down to his shoulders. He had piercing white eyes surrounded by dark black rings. His twisted smile revealed a row of sharp, jagged teeth, and his skin didn't look like skin at all. It almost looked like rubber or plastic. He wore a patchy, black and white clown outfit with striped sleeves and socks. His body itself was grotesque, his long arms hanging down past his waist in the way that he was poised made him almost look boneless, like a rag doll. He let out a sickening laugh as if to let me know that he was pleased with my reaction to his work. He then turned around slowly in front of James and began to laugh even more at the horrific sight he had laid out. And that was enough to shake me from my terror. I snapped. Get away from him, you bastard! I rushed at the monster raising the knife above my head and stabbed down at him. But as soon as the knife touched him, he disappeared into a cloud of black smoke. The knife passed right through and pierced James's still beating heart, splashing the warm blood on my face. No. <laughs> what have I done? My baby. I killed my baby. I immediately fell to my knees, and I could hear sirens in the distance growing louder. My boy. My sweet baby boy. I promised mommy would protect you. But I failed. I'm sorry, James. I'm so sorry. Police soon arrived to find me in front of my son, still willing the knife covered in my baby's blood. The trial was short. Insanity. I was placed in the Pyropolis house for the criminally insane, where I had been for the past two months. It's not so bad here. And the only reason I'm awake now is because someone is playing Pop Goes the Weasel outside my window. I'll talk to the orderlies about it in the morning.